Okay, now we're going to start on to chapter 13. Um, we know that Cracker went in on um, a mission and uh, saved uh, the guys and found several traps. Rick earned some respect and uh, they learned about some different things, learned about something called immersion foot, but from having wet feet all the time. And, and uh, Rick did, had a pretty uneventful um, trip um, on the second one that we read about. So let's get started on chapter 13. One day, Cody requisitioned a power generator from a runway during a mission. A generator was just lying there unguarded, and Cody got a bunch of guys to help him carry it and throw it into a deuce and a half. Nobody ever stole anything in Vietnam. Basically, and if, if an item wasn't nailed down, it was fair game. So you could requisition an item, requisition said item, and instead of Sarge being mad at you, you would rise in his estimation. So the 67th IPSD had traded the generator for material for kennels and barracks, which the handler spent the next week building and surrounding with sandbags. So you see how this word requisition is in quotation? That's sarcasm. They're saying it sarcastically. Requisition means you requested it. He didn't. He just took it because they left it unattended. Requisitioning was an important part of surviving in Vietnam. Mike was the base camp's procurement specialist. That means he got stuff for you. And the 67th IPSD had appointed 20, its personal procurement specialist. In country, the guys often just shortened his name to 20. 20 took the generator to Mike and not only got the building material, but also snagged a case of Coke. He was a better bargainer than Cody. Cody would give away his grandmother for a tiny jar of foot fungus cream. Another good thing about 2020 was that his uncle just happened to be a well-decorated lieutenant colonel who just happened to be stationed in Saigon, who just happened to have dined at the White House, and who just happened to thank the world of 20. 20's uncle gave him a little extra bargaining power. Not a lot because he couldn't go crying to his uncle about every little thing, but the guys knew that if it was really important, uncle was always there. Rick took the case of Coke back to Mike. Mike was actually wearing a paper crown. The man was power crazy, but no question, he was the king of the base. Mikey, how about some shingles for the doghouse roofs? Mike laughed. Shingles? Just for a case of Coke? What do you think this is, Minnesota? Mm, I'm from Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Minnesota, Wisconsin, whatever. I ain't got shingles. Well, what else you got? For crying out loud, why couldn't the guy just cooperate? Got some tin, Mike said. All right, just give me that. We'll make do. Mike looked at him. Dang it. I don't know why I feel sorry for you guys. The tin's on the house. Keep your coke. On the house means free, guys. Thanks, Rick said. He paused and added, nice crown. The tools were hardly state-of-the-art, but Rick was able to take charge. In fact, he preferred a regular saw to an electric one because he enjoyed working with his hands so much. He'd never been in charge of anything before, but all those tables he'd made really helped him build the kennels. They didn't have porches, but they did, but they did the job. It felt kind of good to be in charge after a lifetime of being simply a good worker. Anyway, now the dogs had nicer accommodations. Cracker's kennel was next to Tristy's. She knew Rick had arranged that. She just knew, like she always knew when Rick, Cody, and 2020 were coming before she saw them. She could smell them or hear them. Or she would just know. Sometimes Bruno or Tristy knew first and would stand up and move to their gates. That was the sign for Cracker to move to her gate as well. So by the time the guys arrived, all three dogs would always be sitting in front of their kennels waiting. Their guys always showed up first. And then Cracker, Bruno, and Tr Tristy liked to jump around their kennels in celebration. They had the best guys. The next assignment Rick pulled freaked him out. He'd be walking point in front of the entire company of 150 men. 150. He remembered the night at the dinner table when he told his family he wanted to whip the world. Pretty easy to say in a frame house in a town in Wisconsin. Now he figured that just in case, he should drop his parents a line. He wrote only that he was going out on his first big mission and that he'd write more later. Then he figured it was better not to worry them and tore up the letter. So drop a line is an idiom for writing someone a letter, guys. That evening, Rick brushed Cracker twice, murmuring her favorite words. Good girl. 
the whole time. Then he told her, we're going to have a whole company following us. This is big stuff. Over and over, he said, it's big stuff, girl, big stuff. But he didn't know whether that was true. It could be another dud. In the late afternoon, Cody and 20 both got back from the field looking like, well, like they just got back from a war. They didn't say a word through dinner and left the mess hall immediately. Nobody spoke as they walked to the kennels. Instead of sitting among the trees like they usually did, they all sat behind the warehouse. Cracker galloped to where Bruno and Tristy were chasing rats in a rice paddy. In the distance, Rick watched some locals going through the base garbage dump. Cody stuck a piece of gum in his mouth. 2020 lit a cigarette. Both seemed deep in thought. So what's up, man? Rick finally asked. 20 took a breath and nodded for a few seconds, as if thinking. It was confusing out there, he said at last. You can't tell which of the indigenous personnel are friendlies and which aren't. He lowered his voice as some Vietnamese army had hired, that the army had hired to do laundry walk past. You don't know who to trust. The villagers look just like Charlie. The original aim of the United States had been to win the hearts and minds of the villagers, but it all seemed to be in the past now. All right, you guys, when they say it's indigenous, that means native people. I shot a Viet Viet Cong girl. I mean, she was armed. She aimed a rifle at me. But, you know, I didn't really expect to be fighting girls. You shot a girl, said Rick. He'd heard a lot of girls fought for the Viet Cong, but to shoot one? 2020 turned angrily to Rick. You weren't there, you know. Easy, man. I, I didn't mean anything. Cody, frowning, said, If she was going to kill you, you got to protect yourself. Yeah, I know. 2020 leaned his head back against the wall. The dogs were freaking out over a rat. 20 smiled at Tristy barking and hopping around. She's the only worthwhile thing in this war. Bruno ran over just to say hi to Cody. Even he looked different. He'd always been the oldest dog in the squad, but now Rick noticed white hairs on his nose that he'd never noticed before. Rick spied some more rats sticking their heads up in the field. Hey, let's pop some rats. He'd seen some old-timers do it when they needed a little tension release. Cody and 20 seemed unsure, but then Cody smiled and said, Yeah, those rats are driving me nuts. I saw one in the mess hall the other day. And then it was like old times again. Rick got blasting caps and cheese. and He, 20, 20, and Cody walked into the field laughing. The dogs went crazy. Cracker even managed to grab a big rat in her mouth and shake it dead. Good girl, Rick called out. He had a hot dog in his pocket and he'd been planning that he had been planning to give her later. His mother had been sending him five dollars now and then and he'd been using the money to buy hot dogs for Cracker for Mike. He gave her a piece of one now. Then he placed cheese on a couple of blasting caps and jogged off to watch Twenty and Cody. They'd called their dogs to them. The dogs obeyed, Cracker the most reluctantly. She kept looking back over her shoulder at the paddy. A moment later a huge rat jumped on a blasting cap. Boom! Cracker and Tristy danced the happy dance. Soldiers! The guys jumped up. Geez, it was a captain. Rick had never even talked to the captain. He and his friends stood stiff, dogs at their sides. May I ask what you're doing? The captain asked, in a voice that implied he knew perfectly well what they were doing. Fortunately, he was standing in front of 2020. 2020 said, Sir, we noticed that some of the rodent population was becoming problematic, sir. The rodent population has gotten so brazen that they sometimes walk right up to the mess hall while we're eating, sir. And we decided to resolve that problem, sir. And that's enough, private. I want all of your names. 2020 said, my name is Brian Butler, sir. You may know my uncle, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Butler, after whom I was named and who I, uh, whom, by the way, was awarded two silver stars, the Distinguished Flying Cross, 11 Air Medals, and the Legion of Merit. The captain paused. Brian Butler? He paused again. All right, just pick up the unexploded caps in the field, and and I don't want to see you wasting good ammunition on any more rats. Later that night, the handler's barrack was nearly empty with most of the guys out on missions. Rick thought about how different Cody and 2020 were than they had been a week ago. They seemed older. The clearest way he could tell they were different was because they kn- he knew they hadn't changed, but he could tell he didn't quite fit in with them anymore, and Cody didn't seem to be up as upbeat as he used to. Rick wondered if he himself could be different a week or two from now. Monsoon season was in full force and the winds howled and the rain poured. Rick listened to it, pound off the roof that night. Even in the darkness, he could feel that 2020 was awake. 2020, he said. Yeah, you saved our butts. 
But I thought your name was Orin after your grandfather. Yeah, I was. Rick closed his eyes. He hoped Cracker was getting a good rest. Actually, Cracker was still awake thinking of Rick. A trickle of rainwater ran through her kennel. She moved to avoid it. She ran. She heard a rat-a-tat-tat noise in the distance. They were different from the noises Rick's guns made. Inside the kennel, the trickle seemed to be following her. She moved again and sighed as she laid down her head. The next morning, Rick showed up again. She stood very still. She could feel how nervous he was, like his blood was tingling, and that made her nervous. She wondered what it was that was making their blood tingle together. This is it, Cracker. Cracker stared straight at him. She knew exactly what he was saying, namely that something important was happening and that it was happening to them both together. She felt so eager to please him that when he opened the gate, she spun around several times chasing her tail before she could bring herself to sit in front of him. Another soldier came by and stood next to him. This the dog, he said. Cracker, Rick said, and Cracker wagged her tail. Cracker's the best dog in Vietnam. The other soldier narrowed his, narrowed his eyes. Cracker hopped around chasing herself. She better be, because we're going to be in a hot zone. Hot zone? Cracker had heard that while they were running around before the long trip over here. Whenever there was gunfire in the air or men hidden in bushes, Rick would lean in and say hot zone. She listened now but didn't hear any gunfire. She looked up at Rick to ask him about the hot zone. He didn't say anything, just slung his sack on his back and walked with the other soldier to where the chopper was already waiting, its blades whirling. At the chopper, he knelt next to her and leaned toward one, e one of her ears. You are the best dog in Vietnam, Rick shouted. Do you understand? Dog, she wagged her tail. We're heading south toward Ben Hoa, but not quite that far. Ben Hoa. Rick saw a couple of dozen choppers had already taken off and more were landing to pick up soldiers. Man, he'd never seen so many choppers in the air at once. They were going to kick some butt. He also saw some Cobra gunships, nicknamed Sharks or Redbirds, circling in the distance. Their front ends painted with red and white shark's teeth. These are airplanes, guys, bombers. After half a dozen other men had boarded the chopper, he and Cracker climbed on. Rick hunched over and avoided the back, the back, even though the top blades whirled at least a foot above his head, and the rear blades churned several feet away. As he climbed aboard, he suddenly had a funny feeling. He didn't feel like him. That is, he knew he was him, and he knew it was him climbing into the chopper, but he didn't feel quite feel as if he were there. He didn't feel as if he were anywhere else either. It was just that he had expected this moment to feel intense, and instead it felt far away. Rick took a place in the center and sat with Cracker. The other men looked curiously at her. A couple of them smiled and petted her. Cracker leaned her nose out the door, open door, but Rick pulled her back hard. No. He knew the centrifugal, centrifugal force would keep her in, but he wanted to be extra safe today. She lay next to him as the bird lifted off. The whole sky was roaring. Someone said, hey, dog man, I hope you're smiling when this is over. Rick realized he'd been half grinning, and he probably looked stupid. He was grinning more from nervousness than anything else, his first hot zone. As they rose, nobody spoke. Rick didn't know any of the guys on board, but they looked like they'd been, been here a while. There was something different in their eyes. Down below in the fields, Rick saw the bomb craters, some of them filled with dirty water. From a heavy forest beyond a rice paddy, smoke circled upward. Rick took a big breath and said into Cracker's ear, I hope that's not where we're going. But they went on. The thunder in Rick's ear started to seem normal. Every so often, he'd see a fist of smoke shooting upward from the ground. Suddenly, the chopper started to descend, hovering above a rice paddy. The men began to jump out. Then Rick had the feeling he'd been expecting, like he was here, really here, like this was it. His heart pounded hard and his whole body felt as if it were quivering. He started to hop out and Cracker launched off at the same time, flying past him. No, he shouted. Too late. Cracker was already hurtling forward, sailing to the end of her leash. The leash snapped taut and Rick slammed face down in the stagnant water. By the time he righted himself, the helicopter had lifted away and everybody was laughing at him. Claimed he was... Claimed he had the best dog in Vietnam, he heard someone say. Rick wiped the water from his face, furious. Bad, bad first impression. Very bad. Another chopper hovered, and more men jumped off. Dog handler, the lieutenant called out. 
Yes, sir, Rick shouted, his voice sounding louder than he had meant to. Southeast, dog handler. Yes, sir. He thought about adding, my name is Hansky, sir, but he decided not to. Cracker, search. They were on what was officially called a search and destroy mission. Unofficially, find them and fix them. A reconnaissance patrol believed there might be enemy in this area. Reconnaissance means spies, guys. The mission now was to find Charlie or anything that might help him and destroy it. It, was also, it also meant that if they made contact, they were to kill the enemy, fix him. Cracker sniffed the air. She leaned her head left and then right. A smell drifted through her nostrils. Her ears flicked once, but just at the newness of the situation. Rick wondered whether that flicker was enough for him to stop the 150 guys behind him. He decided not, and they trudged on for a few more minutes. Cracker raised her head and turned it more to the south than east. Her ears stood up straight. That was a definite alert. Rick turned to Raphael, the guy walking behind him. He moved his fingers to a, in a kind of short wave. Raphael was Rick's slack man, but this was the first time they'd worked together. Funny to think that two guys who hadn't known each other the day before now depended on each other for their lives. Raphael hurried up beside Rick. What you got? Raphael asked in a low voice. I don't know. She's alerting south. It's definite, but not immediate. I mean, it's not like the enemy is two feet away, but it's definitely people, not mechanical. She sits for booby traps. Raphael had just left to report to the company leader when a gunshot fired. Rick knew immediately that it was an AK-47. He didn't make the same mistake twice. Everybody's legs dropped out from under them, water from the rice paddy splashing upward. Rick and Cracker lay flat behind a low dike, men close on either side of them. The adrenaline make Rick, made Rick's skin buzz. Guys, a dike is just like a little tiny um, mound that they, like a dam that would be holding the water into the rice paddy, like the edge of the edge or lip of a, of a pond or a lake type of thing that the light, rice paddy was. His mind felt clearer than it had felt maybe ever. He figured the shot had come from the south, and when he looked down the row, he saw other men aiming their guns in that direction. Down, Cracker, he said, though she was already down. The men to the left of him asked in a low voice, how many are there? He had Cracker. Rick had noticed that some of the guys who weren't familiar with scout dog teams seemed to think that the handlers could read the dog's minds. Uh, I don't know. Another gunshot sounded, followed closely by yet another. The shot seemed to come from two different directions. At least two, the man to the right said. Rick heard the radio man behind him. Alpha, Alpha, this is Ranger. We got two bad guys firing small arms. He gave their coordinates and asked for support. Do you copy? Rick could hardly hear the reply. It sounded mostly like static over the radio. But then he heard the radio man say, that's a 10-4. They didn't move. Nobody moved. But like all the guys, Rick held his M16 low and ready. Rick was proud of how well behaved Cracker was. Her leash lay under the water somewhere. Cracker lay still but alert. Rick's foot went to sleep. Then a hand went to sleep. Sometimes the fire seemed to be coming from different directions, but never from more than two at once. Rick lay with his left side of his face immersed in the water. Cracker tried to lap at the water and Rick hissed, No. If she drank this stagnant water, she might get sick. But he couldn't get a canteen out right now. At one point, Cracker moved her nose forward and pushed at his face under the water. He reached under the water and felt something slimy attached to his cheek. He couldn't stop himself from trying to see what was there. He slowly turned his head until he could see something black bulging from it, a leech. For some insane reason, the leech made him almost laugh out loud. It made him think of how crazy it would be to die out here with a leech attached to his cheek. Cracker suddenly leapt straight up in the air, almost as if somebody had picked her up and thrown her. She splashed down in the water. He frowned at her as she leapt again. A shot whizzed by. She splashed down. Down, Rick whispered urgently. A shot hit the dike right down on the other side of where they lay. Rick felt something bite him and nearly jumped himself. The soldiers on either side of them started it inching away as another shot whizzed over Rick's head. The soldiers kept inching away until only he and Cracker remained. Cracker looked at Rick desperately as she jumped into the air again. Rick tried to hold his gun with one hand and grab her paws with the other. Down, stay down. He heard a staticky voice over the radio and then the reply from the radio man. That's a 10-4, fire when ready. Someone called out, take cover, incoming. Rick saw the smoke from the mortar fire. It looked about 20 meters away. He heard the radio guy again, Alpha, Alpha, this is Ranger. Move, one half click to the south. Do you copy? The fire ceased immediately, then resumed farther to the south. A click was a kilometer. Someone hissed from Rick's right. 
the lieutenant was signaling him to move. Rick gave Cracker the crawl gesture, and they slithered through the water. The other soldiers were also slithering along. Every so often, one of them must have inadvertently raised his body too high, for a shot would explode in the air ahead of them or behind them. So the snipers no doubt knew the company was on the move. But after more mortar fire, the snipers fell silent. One by one, the men crawled through the nip of palms circling the padding. They kept crawling until they reached cover of the jungle. It was only there that Rick allowed Cracker to stand up. Rick reached to pull the leech off his cheek. Don't touch it, Raphael said. They leave their jaws embedded in the flesh of, of you if you try to pull them off. you got to make them let go with a cigarette or bug juice. The men were all drenched. Rick knelt to check Cracker. A leech dangled from her belly. Maybe that's what had caused her to jump. Although he'd heard leeches released anesthetic so that you didn't feel it when they bit you, or even when they hung on for hours, someone tapped his shoulder and nodded toward where the lieutenant Water dripping from his face was signaling Rick to come forward. Rick and Cracker hurried over. Take the point, dog handler. If those snipers are still alive, let's fix them. The adrenaline had drained from Rick. He was exhausted. He didn't even care about the leech on his cheek anymore. He still felt bad for Cracker, but he knew he couldn't take the time to pull off her leeches or his own. Yes, sir, he said. He put on Cracker's harness and tried to sound calm yet urgent. Search, Cracker. Search. Search.